Welcome to the Elevate Everyday Podcast. I'm your host, Kay Junkert. I own Fitness Junkie Training, and it's Veterans Day today when we're recording this, um, and I've got a badass veteran here on the podcast. His name is John Brink. This man is 83 years old. Um, he went through World War II. Um, he's also uh, a bodybuilder, even at, I think he competed in the last few years, which is amazing. Um, he owns John Brink Group of Companies, um, and it's got a really high evaluation. I, I saw online that it was in the billions. Um, John uh, <laughs> kind of told me that it's not quite that much, but you know, it is a very large company um, or group of companies. So he's a serial entrepreneur, super successful man, um, excited to, to share everything that this man's going to have to share um, for you guys and provide some value to you. So First and foremost, really appreciate you coming on the podcast, John, um, and I'm excited to get into this. Thanks, Kate. I uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely, sir. So, yeah, so, um, you know, kind of just first question, since it is Veterans Day and everything, and you were just talking about, you know, we've we've got to cut this a little bit short because he's going to be speaking um, to the youth about, you know, remembering and stuff like that. Just what was maybe some of the, the most valuable lessons and memories from your experience um you know in world war ii and just everything that that you went through with all that yeah so i was born in november the first 1940 in eastern holland and uh, for those uh, uh people from around the world that are watching us uh, and that are not familiar with holland it's the extreme northeastern part about 20 minutes from the the German border in about 20 minutes, 15 minutes from the sea that connects the North Sea to Northern Germany and Northern Holland. So in that corner, I was born and uh, uh, my dad was uh, drafted into the Dutch uh, army uh, in April of 1940 at the start of the war. Uh, for the next five years, they wouldn't know if he uh, was dead or alive because the last time they heard about him, he was caught at the bombing of Rotterdam that killed thousands of people. And, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so my mom had, uh, three children. I was born obviously in the war already in November the 1st, this last week. And, uh, you know, and then I had a sister, one year old, a brother, two years old. And, uh, it was rough going. I remember from the time that I was about three and a half to four years old. And, uh, hundreds of bombers in the air uh, bombing the Germans uh, in, in their infrastructure to support the war. And what we used to do in the evenings, we would be standing outside on the flat roof in the back of the house to watch the bombers, not because for anything nice about it, but the sound and the fear with it. Uh, my mother felt safer being outside rather than inside in the distance we would see the cities burning like Bremen, Kiel, and all those German cities just on the other side of the border in a distance and planes coming back, being shot at. And uh, so it was a, a difficult time. Then that, uh, 1944, 1945 was called the hunger winter where there was no more food. Uh, the Germans had cut off all the access to food and it was extremely cold. And I still, even now still remember the pain of not having food okay. and then the pain of feeling the cold and the heat we had a little stove in one room of the whole house and starting to stay warm and then in the mornings but the kids used to do, my brother, my sister, and myself, we would have gunny sacks, go into the railroad yards, pick up anything edible and, and burnable. Uh -huh. The reason that we did is because the Germans would shoot the adults with us, they would boot us one, and then we'd be back the next morning. And then we were liberated on April the 12th, 1945, by the Canadian Army. And it made such an impression on me that I always knew from that point forward I would go to Canada. I tried to go when I was uh, 17. My parents wouldn't let me then. And then I was drafted into the du uh, Dutch uh, Air Force. And uh, then I finally won when I was 24 years old and I went to Canada. Wow. So that's kind of the background on the, the war. But the uh, it affected me in the sense, uh, Kate, that 
I was affected by PTSD, seeing far too much that we should not have seen. We right. were in the extreme northeastern part as the Canadians pushed out the Germans back across the border. Uh, they, the Germans would blow up all the bridges behind them. And a lot of people got killed and, and hurt. And then the, and the no man's land, when the Canadians were not quite there and the Germans were gone, uh, a lot of people were shot, in particular the people from the underground uh, went after their collaborators and uh, uh, were shot. And we saw far too much that we should not have seen. And, uh, and it uh, affected us, including, uh, you know, the PTSD that always stayed with you because it does to a certain extent. And then the other part was uh, affected by the inner child. And uh, mm -hmm. I was well over 50 when I got uh, counseling for it and uh, very very emotional that little boy five right. years old and uh you know so uh yeah so and and it is so important for me to share that with the younger generation that appreciating what we got here in north america both canada and the united states how lucky we are a lot of times, especially right now when we look around the world and the Ukraine and obviously uh, in the Middle East and all the things that are going on that, you know, that I believe it is important for me to share my experience and the importance of remembering stay in the two minutes of silence as to why is that important? And even more importantly, how quickly things can change. All the things that you take for granted your family, and then going to the store, picking up this, that, and all of a sudden everything changed. And so right. I want them, and I feel an obligation to talk about it uh, every year. And I've done that for the last 10, 12 years, but I speak to two, three, four schools uh, about it. Uh, and in the next half hour, I will again be at a school uh, with a, a number of hundreds of people talking about uh, you know my experiences. And I believe it is so important to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I 100% agree. We we take so much for granted. I mean, just hearing everything that you went through, John, it's like, you know, most people don't go through that stuff, especially these days. And it's, it's incredible um, how much we do take for granted. And, it, you know, what are your thoughts on like, do you feel like maybe we're, we're ignorant these days, or it's just like, maybe we're not counting our blessings. Or, like, what, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, just hearing certain stories, like stuff that you've gone through, John, um, you know, it just makes me feel super grateful. Um, and I appreciate you coming on here and, and speaking your story and everything. But what are your thoughts on just how the youth is these days? Do you think it's just a matter of um, not knowing kind of how good we have it? Um, you know, I, I believe, Kate, that is by and large the case is that we are so used to all the things that we take for granted, uh, you know, uh, including our families and the people that are close to us that overnight, like it happened in Holland, uh, my parents uh, were married when they were 38. My dad uh, got a nice job. They got a place. They were in love. And very quickly, they had uh, uh, two children. And then I was the third one. And, and then all of a sudden, overnight, uh, you know, when uh, Germany uh, invaded Poland and then from there and then the Blitzkrieg into the Benelux or the Holland, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg happened uh, in about April of 1945 and everything changed instantly. My dad was no longer there and my mom was on her own with three little kids. And although there were a lot of people around that, but everybody had the same issues, the same problems, everything changed. Yeah. And you didn't know what would happen next. And, uh, uh, you know, and and a lot of people were taken from the communities and sent into uh, uh, the concentration camps and never came back, you know, and uh, it changed everything. And uh, my point is always that it was not a question of some people believe that, that, you know, you have war and the war is over now, everything is back to normal. It isn't. It may take generations before it ever gets back to a sense of normality. Right. And that's why it is so important for us as we watch the TV, look at the people all over the world, you know, that are being affected by wars, uh, you know, without going into whose fault is and all that kind of stuff. Wars are bad. And, and, 
we should do everything possible that we can to avoid it and uh, and especially younger children usually become the victims of it uh, emotionally physically and all the other things uh, it will change everything absolutely yeah and I, I i like this quote and i think this really pertains to you um i i don't know who originally said this but i've heard tony robbins say this where you know tough times create strong men. Um, and then, you know, easy times create weak men, right? And you're, you're definitely a strong man. I mean, you, you've accomplished so much and you've been through the roughest of times. Um, do you think us going through easy times or not having it as rough? Do you think that we're going to be weaker if we don't kind of counter blessings? Like wh what are your thoughts on that? Do you think we have it so easy right now as a, as a youth or just, you know, younger individuals, young men, um, do you, do you think this is going to create like a, a weak generation? What, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on this, uh, Kate, a good, good question is that it is much, I say that many, many times I'm a professional speaker as well. I do a lot of, uh, speaking all over the place and, uh, do, uh, you know, so that, but I usually say it is much easier or if there is such a thing as easy to go from a tough time to a better time than from having everything and taking everything from granted to a much more difficult time. Right. So we were, although it was challenging all the way, if you have to go the other direction and you have not had some of the experience that I had not necessarily the same, the other, I, I felt very strongly about that. And, uh, so the other thing that I do that, that you may have noticed, I'm also an author and, uh, you know, so, and, uh, you know, people wanted me to write a book about it for many years. And I, uh, for the last 20 years, I've been trying to write a book, start, stop, start. Writing books is not easy. And so I finally did it. And the book is against all odds. Wow. It's not so much about how successful it is, John. It's an audible as well. Uh, that I did on that one. It's all about going through the ups and the ups and downs and, and saying that, but, but the quality staying the course, never give up and, uh, you know, and believing all in the fundamentals and the fundamentals to me are, uh, the other part uh, uh, is that when I finally came to Canada, when I was 24, I had a dream. The dreams that I had is to go to Canada. The second dream was to build my own lumber mill and 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 the third one was I was not very successful in school. I failed grade three. I failed grade seven three times. I would only find out much later as to why this all happened. But I felt that I was a failure and I wanted to start all over again. So with very little money, I left Holland. I wanted to go to British Columbia. I'm in Prince George, British Columbia, about 500 miles north of Vancouver to build a lumber mill. And But I wanted to start with nothing right from the ground up. So when I, I have to show you this, when I came off the bus here in Prince George in July of 1965, I had in my pocket $25.47. Wow. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't know a soul and I didn't have a job. And I started as a cleanup man. And then uh, within a couple of years already, I was a superintendent of one of the larger lumber mills here. And within 10 years, I started the company Bring Forest Products. But what I did have is attitude. I will always look at the positive side. I avoid people that are negative. I had a passion. I love Canada. I love what I'm doing. And then work ethic. I work harder than anybody. Those are the fundamentals to success. And so what I usually do, even now at 83, I get up at 530 in the morning uh, I, uh, and, and then I think I'm late and then I always make my bed and then I go to work and then uh, obviously uh, I'm not trying to be important, but uh, there are always challenges, but uh, you know, and, uh, but that's all, I love what I'm doing. And uh, you know, and, and, and then the other part about it is that I just have to tell you that as well, is that it took till 1997, you know, that i became a little clear to me as to what had happened to my academic failure, if you wish, or why didn't I go further in grade seven? I was a very, very good writer and very good at numbers. And I walked into a store and I found a book and the title of the book was, 
you know, I opened the book and I don't know why I did it. It was driven to distraction and it was about ADHD. And I said, oh my God, now I finally know what happened. And I wrote in Dutch inside the book because I was ashamed of it. Now I finally know what I am of, uh, you know, and who I am. And so, uh, so then it took me a number of years until I kind of found out what had happened here, you know, and, and what is ADHD and initially a lot of stigma because I'm building companies. What am I going to do? Go to the bank and say, I'm going to lend from you millions of dollars to build this mill and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Use my business plan, all good and good. And then I said, oh, by the way, I should tell you, I have a mental disorder called ADHD. And you say, have a nice day, right? So not so now, but I felt I had to talk about that part more and more. And I did that and, and I do that. But then I felt I had to write a book about it. So I wrote a book here in the last couple of years, ADHD Unlocked. And that is about ADHD uh, issues with distraction, slow learners, or people that dream away and have difficult time focusing. But it's also for people that are affected by trauma and a number of other things. Wow. And so the book, very popular throughout the world, again, also on Audible. And, uh, you know, and so I believe it was important for me to do that. And now the other part I should say quickly about it is that I always thought that it was about, and other people thought about 8% of the population that is affected by ADHD. I believe that is more like 20% or more. And then the other part about it, Aiden, is that, uh, Kate, is that I believe that for all intents and purposes, for anybody should understand it because it may be in your family and your friends or in your workplace, you will encounter people affected by uh, or blessed with, I call, because I call it a superpower. I could not have done what I did unless I did it for this. So yes. I recommend to all people to become understanding of ADHD or attention deficit issues it's a superpower and those people tend to be a little bit different. So find out about them by not only my book, but are other books as well that do that. So, uh, so that's kind of, uh, but kind of gives you a bit of a background on that part of me. For sure. Yeah. And I, I had looked that up that you were kind of an advocate of turning ADHD into like a superpower um, and this is probably, the, you know, the last question I'll ask you, John, just because I know you got a hard stop and I know you got to make it to to speak to the youth and I'm totally respect that. Um, but, you know, if you can just share with the listeners, like, how can you turn something like ADHD or even ADD, just any sort of attention deficit, like into a superpower? Can you give us just one kind of practical takeaway with that? But I would say find out more about it, including read not only my book, but other books that are in there. Mine is easy to follow. I wrote it with the ADHD person in mind, but also look at this book, Against All Odds, because it then shows that obviously I've always been ADHD. I've had a number of other challenges that I had to work. This one is from the heart. It includes all the good, the bad, and the ugly, but 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 kind of tells the story from somebody with ADHD, how did they make it through uh, their way uh, uh, following their dream, following the Second World War, but also felt like I failed grade three, I failed grade seven three times. I thought I had I was a failure and I had to start anew again. And then it is unfortunate it took so long for me to figure it out, but now I'm very proactive on the road about it. And I say it's a superpower. Do not allow anybody to say it is different. It is a gift, in my opinion. Once you understand it, make it work for you. Most successful people, entrepreneurs that have been immensely successful, ADHD. And I could not have done it without it. I, I agree. You know, I, I feel like I've heard the, the phrase entrepreneurial ADD and stuff like that. And it's almost just like you're focused on all these different things. But I, I think it's essential. Like you've got to be able to do a lot of different things, have your have your hat in different your wear different hats, kind of, 
you know, be doing a lot of different things at once to be a successful entrepreneur. So I, I completely understand um, how that could actually help you and be a superpower, you know, in the entrepreneurial realm. So that's super and the other thing that I should tell you before we end is that I did another book here quickly I want to show to you is that a lot of people don't have the passion. You say, I don't know what I want to do. I don't like my job and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I heard this thing on I, uh, CNN or one of the other ones. We watch a lot of US TV, obviously. And, uh, you know, there was a statistic that said 70% of the population do not like their job. And 70% of the 75% of the 70% are looking for another job. So I had already wanted to make a, a write a book about finding that passion, or if you don't have it, find it because it will change your life. So I wrote this one, finding your passion, living the dream. And, uh, you know, and that again is an audible book too. And then I'm doing one more and this comes to uh, apparently you related to stay physically fit, stay, stay mentally fit, diet, exercise critical and i'm writing a book on that and it is called living young dying old it's all about quality of life and this comes quickly to what you were saying earlier is that uh uh i'm a competitive bodybuilder apparently uh, the oldest competitive bodybuilding in north america wow. i qualified for the uh, nationals here and for the arnolds and i'm training again to again compete uh uh, and the, on the Arnold's uh, in 2024, uh, I've already talked to uh, Arnold about it. And he said, I, yeah, we want to get a picture together. So that's what you're going to do. That's amazing, man. That's super inspirational. And I, I love when you showed the what you came um, with with just $25. And it said um, attitude, passion, and work ethic. I think those two or those three things, absolutely vital. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that just that makes me success. Yes. That's what follows that, you know, so yeah, no, for sure. I love, I love that. I'm super inspired by you, John. I feel like I can run through a wall right now, man. I, I just want to be like you when I'm in my eighties. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on here. You know, I wish we could talk longer, but I totally respect your time. I know you got to speak and spread your message and everything. Um, but guys, you know, take some of the stuff that John shared with you, put it into practice right away here on the, on the elevate everyday podcast. It's about, you know, hearing information and then putting it into practice right away. It's not just about listening. Don't just absorb, you know, put this stuff into place in your life. So I, I will send you copies of these books. I will sign them for you. If you oh, let wow. Scott know uh, the address, then we'll uh, sign them, send them to you. Amazing. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll again, stay in touch. We'll do another one a bit longer, uh, you know, when you have the time. So we'll, we'll stay in touch, uh, Katie. Sorry about that. It had to be a little bit short. No, totally understand. And I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to, to reading these books, guys. Go check John's books out. Um, Against All Odds. Um, What, what were the other two that you, you showed? Uh, yeah, so ADHD Unlocked and Finding Your Passion, Living the Dream. Awesome. And they're audible as well on all major medias. Very cool. Amazing, John. Well, I really appreciate you, sir. I'll let you go. Um, but thank you so much for being on the Elevate Everyday podcast. Thank you to the listeners for tuning into this. Put this stuff into practice right away. Check out John's books. Um, but guys, I'll see you in the next video. Stay tuned. Subscribe to have expert guests like John every single week. Um, and I'll see you in the next video, guys. But in the meantime, elevate every damn day. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, Take care. Bye-bye. Peace. Elevate. Only obligation is to tell it straight.